City First was good. I am so excited to be with you today. We are starting a brand new series today called Essentials for 2020. And I think it's important because I don't think anyone prepared well for 2020. And it's, it's a little bit past halftime in the year. And the reality for you and me is we actually can choose a life where we're constantly reacting to things that happen around us, or we can prepare for things that happen all around us. This is a series about preparing for the rest of the year that could very well be bumpy roads as we continue to navigate COVID-19, diversity and race conversations, and an election that is just around the corner. There are some essential character traits that you and I desperately need for 2020 that are found in Scripture. We're going to look at in this series that comes from the book of Colossians written by the Apostle Paul. Now, here's the deal. Um, Colossians was written during one of Paul's uh, many imprisonments for announcing and claiming that Jesus is the risen Lord. Uh, the letter is actually addressed to a group of people that Paul had never met who made up a church community that he did not start. Now, this church in Colossae was started by a co-worker of Paul's named Epaphras, who was actually from that city. He had recently visited Paul in prison, and he updated him on how well the Colossians were doing overall. But he also mentioned some of the cultural pressures tempting Colossians to turn away from their relationship with Jesus. So Paul wrote this letter to encourage the Colossians to address those issues that, that Epaphras had raised. And it helped them overcome some of the hurdles they had understanding of what a life in Christ really looked like. So in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul begins like this. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Hand. Paul goes on to compare and contrast who we used to be in our old life and how we used to act and how we used to think and how we used to live BC, before Christ. But now he's inviting them and now us to elevate our lives, to elevate our thinking, to elevate our actions now that we've been given new life in Christ. Now, here's the deal. If you're not a Christ follower today, first off, thank you so much for watching this message. What I want you to know is that new life is available to you right wherever you're watching this message. Now, here's the deal. Here, here's what Paul, Paul he, this is what he says. He says next, and this is, this is going to be the core verse uh, for this uh, Essentials for 2020 series. It says this in verse 12. Since God chose you to be holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I mean, doesn't the world need that? <laughs> Don't you? Don't I? I mean, what would our 2020 look like if we all just had a little bit more tenderhearted mercy? If we had just a little bit more kindness, if we had just a little bit more humility, if we had just a little bit more gentleness and a little bit more patience. Today, I want to begin this collection of talks speaking on the subject of mercy. If you're looking for a title for today's message, it is Lord have mercy. Paul gave us this illustration of how we are to move forward into a new life with Christ. To do this, he used the words, clothe yourself, put it on, get dressed, let it be a part of your wardrobe. I mean, if we're all honest, what we wear says a lot about us. I remember uh, when I was getting ready to um, get a, a brand new client for my executive coaching practice. And uh, it was a really big client. It was a really big interview. And, uh, you know, going into interview-like situations, you're trying to figure out, do I wear a suit? Uh, do, I, do I wear jeans? What, what do I do? And, and, and I had kind of looked up the CEO, and, and he was a little bit more casual. So I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm going to wear some, some nice dress shoes, some nice jeans. 
and a button up. Okay, so it's just like real, real chill. No, no, no big deal because that, that's how I, that's how the CEO looked. But come to find out, I show up, my button up, my jeans, dress shoes, everybody in suits. And so I, I, I felt that like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm underdressed. What's wrong with me? And that was on a Monday. Well, the interview went decent and they were like, hey, can you come back? On Friday, I said, Friday is about to go down, okay? Like, like I'm coming with it, okay? I will be ready, okay? Took my suit to the cleaners. I said, it's game time, okay? I show up on Friday suited and booted. And you already know the rest of this story. It was casual Friday. Everybody in T-shirt and jeans, pajamas, sweatpants. And now they're like, who brought the lawyer in today? Who's the overdressed guy? I'm like, I cannot Get this thing right. Uh, Did you know uh, that the number one thing people look for when they're searching for a church, whenever they're on a church website, number one thing they look for is what to wear. (laughs) Because all of us want to, to fit in. No one wants to show up and stick out for the wrong reason. We've got different outfits for different occasions, ranging from weddings to Halloween parties, to vacation. In fact, some of us have some vacation shirts we need to burn. But here's what Paul is doing. He listed five things, five outfits that we need for different occasions. He's pulling us close, saying, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Let me talk to you. Come here. Listen, here's the deal. Here's the deal. The first thing you're going to need to put on in the culture that you live in is mercy. Mercy. Why does he tell us to put on mercy? (laughs) It's like he knew 2020 was coming. Guess what, everybody? There are going to be some people in your life who drive you absolutely crazy, who get on your nerves, who post the wildest stuff you've ever seen. And as people who have been raised to new life in Christ, when you're running into those people, Live with those people, work with those people, are married to those people, see those people. I want you to be wearing mercy. So, (laughs) practically speaking, what does it look like to wear mercy? I think Jesus gives us some insight where he actually connects mercy to something else. Luke chapter 6. Jesus says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. He says, be this way just like dad. You know what I've learned? It's it's always hard to become something that's never been modeled for you. If you're looking for a model of someone who has shown mercy, look no further than God our father, whose specialty is making sure people don't get what they deserve, which is interesting. Because of how Jesus connecting, being merciful to what we see in the next verse. Verse 37, it says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Ladies and gentlemen, the deeper we go into wearing mercy actually means we have to take off judgment. To put on mercy and extend it to others, I actually have to take judging them off the table. Judgment is a difficult subject to talk about in church because everyone lives with the mantra that we shouldn't do it because of the verse we just read and even even the one we find in Matthew chapter 7 where it says, do not judge or you too will be judged. (laughs) So it's understandable why people would say we shouldn't judge because Jesus said it. But when Jesus said, don't judge, he didn't mean that we shouldn't make wise judgments about anything. I mean, many people use this verse in an attempt to silence their critics whenever they feel attacked, interpreting Jesus's meaning as you don't have the right to tell me I'm wrong. Haven't we all had someone use that phrase? Don't judge me. I mean, (laughs) haven't we ourselves used the phrase? I know I have. (laughs) It's the phrase I love to use at the end of sharing something I feel is embarrassing. For example, I can admit to you today that I'm a sucker for Amazon Prime items. I probably don't need, to be honest. I'm not even sure 
how I come across some of these items that magically appear at our home. I go, who bought this? Okay. But then my wife, she looks at me. She's gotten to a place. She don't even say nothing no more. She just looks at me. I mean, just, just every husband watching this knows exactly what I'm talking about. Your wife got a way of just looking at you. You just be like, why are you looking at me like that? I ain't do nothing. You know what you did. Okay. So honestly, I'd rather my wife say something because that look, it just pierces my soul. You know what I'm talking about? All right. So, so last year, I don't remember when it was. Maybe it was for Christmas or something. But somebody, it was probably my son, he ended up buying and purchasing an electric abdominal muscle stimulator. Okay? It's this device that works on your abs while watching the NBA. Okay? I guess I wanted a six-pack without going to the gym. And I thought I could just kind of work in my office, hook up this unit underneath my shirt without anyone ever knowing it. And, 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 and all of a sudden, it would just send electromagnetic shock waves to my abdomen. And I thought after doing that for 20 minutes a day for a month, I'd come out looking like Dwayne Johnson. That's not true. Okay, that is not how it works, ladies and gentlemen. That did not happen. Okay, now I just got to tell you about a moment when my wife came into my office and saw me putting on these electromagnetic sticky pads on my stomach that lose their stickiness after one treatment. All I could say to her in that moment was, don't judge me. Taken in isolation. Jesus' command, do not judge, seems to be everyone's get-out-of-jail-free card that we like to use when we're wanting to dodge negative assessments that might come from outsiders. However, there is much more to these words. He then gives us more context about judging in this second verse where he says, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Ladies and gentlemen, the same measure of mercy we like to receive is the same measure of mercy we should extend to others. Here's what I know about you and what I know about me. There is a little something on the inside of us that wants to see the bad guy get caught. There's a little something on the inside of us that wants to point the finger at someone who has done wrong. But here's the irony in that. None of us enjoy getting a speeding ticket. There's nothing in us that says, yeah, I want a ticket. Nobody does that. We all want to be let off the hook with a warning. We all want mercy. In fact, mercy is the thing that we want most. That's often the thing we want to wear the least. Jesus is giving you and I an invitation to a life where we treat others and judge others in the measure we'd like to be treated and the measure we'd like to be judged. Jesus is inviting us to live a life full of mercy. Today, I want to give you three things, three things that happen when you and I wear mercy. Number one, prejudice fades. Prejudice Fades. Mercy walks into a room with an open mind. Judgment walks into a room with a mind made up and an opinion about everything. You know what Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 24? He says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with the right judgment. I mean, haven't we all fallen for this trap of judging a book by its cover? Except we're not talking about books. We're talking about people. I made the mistake of thinking someone that worked at Target that actually didn't work at Target at all because they were simply wearing a red shirt. Now, here's the deal. I don't know, I don't know how Target tells their employee. I don't know what they tell them about their dress code, okay? But it seems to me, like people at Target, they, like workers at Target, they just tell them, hey, wear some form of red, some fashion of red that you can just, and then just clock in, okay? Just do what you want, okay? As long as it's red, we good, Okay? I saw a Target employee in a Bulls jersey, stocking shelves. I said, well, what, what, what's going on here? So how am I to determine who works there and who doesn't? I saw a guy in a red polo. I said, hey, man, y'all got some more uh, hand sanitizer? He looked at me and said, I don't work here. I said, so you decided to wear khaki pants and a red polo to go get some eggs? Cool, bro. Real cool. I mean, we've all looked at someone and made an assumption about them based off of the car they drove the shoes they were wearing, the neighborhood they live in, age, color of their skin. I've seen people make judgments about people based off of the church they go to. I mean, you, you know what I'm talking about, especially for my single friends watching. You ever told somebody in your small group you're dating somebody from a church across town? They look at you like you betrayed a country. Like, you did what? 
You know, over there, they, for all my parent friends watching, we know very well how competitive and judgmental the parenting space can be. There ain't no mercy there, okay? There is not a park, a soccer field, a basketball court in the country you can find that has mercy raining down. There ain't no judgment-free zone there. When parents and their kids gather at school events, nothing has to be said. It's felt. You know exactly what I'm talking about. My son, he had a Christmas carol concert at his daycare. I drove him to the facility along with my bride, okay? He then went into the class where all the kids are getting on their outfits and, and all of a sudden they come into the performance arts area and they're in a single file line and he sees me and he runs out of the line and screams, Dad, you came! I'm like, bro, I drove you here. This is not a surprise. Now, I got parents looking at me like I'm some sort of absentee father. I'm like, don't judge me. Okay, where is the mercy at? But we're all guilty of this, right? We're all guilty of making judgments about people without knowing their full story. Do you know what that's called? It's called prejudice, ladies and gentlemen. It's pre-judging. It's judging someone before you know anything about them. Some of us wear this on our sleeves. Some of us do this in our marriages, in our dating relationships, at our jobs. We walk into a room assuming the worst about somebody, and I'm guilty of it. What I know about me is that I've always regretted it. I've always regretted judging someone or a situation without seeing the full picture. Instead of prejudging someone before we get the full picture, can you imagine what it would look like if you and I gave people the benefit of the doubt. How many times has someone told us something negative about someone that gave us a bad representation of who that person is? Only to find out later that that story wasn't true. Some of us have judged other people not because of our own experience with them, but because we simply believed what we were told about them from somebody else. At this stage of my life, I've, I've had to become a person that's committed to learning a full picture before I write someone else off because I think I know them. I've had to surrender to the fact that I'm not a know-it-all. Ladies and gentlemen, when we judge others and live without mercy in our life, we position ourselves as know-them-alls. Not know-it-alls, know-them-alls. And you're not. And I'm not. And one of the strategies I've had to fight hard to implement in my own life to resist the urge to assume I already know who people are is remaining curious. When we stop being curious, we assume we know everything about everybody. Judgment assumes. Curiosity learns. And mercy gives a second chance. The danger of thinking we know everything about everybody is we rob ourselves the opportunity to learn anything about anybody. When we wear mercy, prejudice fades into the distance. Let me ask you this question. Is there anybody in your life that you prejudged in the last 30 days, that you made a judgment about in the last 30 days that perhaps you need to be more curious about? Who in your life could you extend some mercy to perhaps it's someone that you don't even know. The second thing that happens when we wear mercy is outsiders can become insiders. Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, what business is, is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside this verse right here is one of the most relevant and significant verses we find in Scripture, ladies and gentlemen, especially in relation to where we are as a culture between people that are followers of Christ and people that are not followers of Christ. If you Google why are Christians so, one of the first things that will pop up is why are Christians so negative and judgmental? In fact, that's often the brand of Christianity, right? Right? I mean, when was the last time you talked to somebody who wasn't a Christian about Christians? Just think about that for a second. Any person that doesn't follow Christ, how many of them would say when they drive past the church would go, oh, yeah, 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 city first. It's that group of people. They're super generous, always kind. They love each other unconditionally. They're always helping people out, and they're always giving each other second chances. People don't say that. That's not the brand of Christianity. That's not the 
brand of church. I think if we just got this verse right and said, you know what? We're going to hold each other accountable inside the church. But you know what? For us, we're not going to be judging outside. We're not going to be pointing our finger at people. In fact, I think right now is perhaps the greatest opportunity to reach people that don't follow Jesus. Mercy might be our greatest tool to give outsiders a chance to become insiders. If you're not a Jesus follower or a Christian church person, just so you know, we think we've discovered something pretty phenomenal. We think you could have peace with God and in your soul. We think habits can be broken. Okay, We think marriages can be restored. We think a relationship between parents and wayward kids can be put back together. We believe God loves you, and we exhaust as many resources as we possibly can to let the world know just that. We really believe we got good news and we like sharing it. But I'll be honest, historically speaking, our approach hasn't been that great. And I don't know how we got it twisted. Somewhere we got confused and believed we could somehow judge people into following Jesus. That if we just pointed our finger at everyone's wrongs, that somehow that would make them want to follow Jesus. What business is it of ours to hold a non-Jesus person, a non-Jesus follower accountable for his or her behavior? What business is it of ours? None. It's none of our business. If you're going to be a follower of Jesus, yeah, there's a certain way that you handle your marriage, your money, your business, your relationships. But what business is it to try and hold somebody that's not a Christian, to that standard, Paul says it's absolutely none of our business. See, the reason some, some of you don't even go to church anymore and don't want to have anything to do with church is you felt like there was this group of Christians judging you for your behavior. And you never signed up to act that way to begin with. You felt judged. And I just have to tell you, that isn't your fault. It's our fault. And I'm sorry if you felt judged before you felt loved. I'm sorry if you felt judged before you ever felt mercy. Our country and world are full of people who have faced all kinds of judgment before they felt mercy and experienced criticism and judgment from Christians before they even had an opportunity to become a Christian. And in the first century, they didn't have that problem. They didn't expect outsiders to behave like insiders. They expected insiders to behave like insiders. We shouldn't be shocked when people who don't follow Jesus act like people who don't follow Jesus. Some of us watch the news and we can't believe our eyes. Some of us scroll on social media and we can't can't believe what we're seeing. Why? I'm not surprised at all. Not because I think that low of people who don't follow Jesus. It's because I am very aware of who I would be if I didn't follow Jesus. Had it not been for his grace and his mercy, I know exactly what I would be doing. Scripture isn't telling us not to judge. It's telling us who to judge. And outsiders are not on the list. What if Christians became more known for mercy than they are judgment? Can you imagine that? Because here's what I know about a judgmental spirit. A judgmental spirit isn't heard, it's felt. And I think it's the same thing with mercy. (laughs) I think a merciful spirit, you ever just get around somebody? It's just, you feel like you can be yourself around them. You, you 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 ever cussed around like a judgmental Christian and you just felt it? But then there's just those people that it's just like, you just feel like you can be with them. Like you can just fully... Be yourself. You're not walking on eggshells around that person. Judgment isn't heard. Judgment is felt. I mean, we could say, I didn't say anything, but our face says it all. Our demeanor says it all. I mean, isn't our demeanor often an indicator of of our soul? I mean, just think about it. You ever had somebody cook for you? They weren't that good of a cook. Maybe you were a guest at the house. Maybe it was Thanksgiving. Maybe your in-laws made something. You had to smile, pretend like it was good. But everybody at that table knows exactly how you felt about that casserole. Everybody knows. You can see it on your face. You can't even pretend. Likewise, people can feel our judgment and disapproval of things they do and say. Right now, you got two types of people in this world. 
at least in America. You got the mask wearing people, okay? And you got the non mask wearing people. Mess around and be a non mask wearing person, hanging out with a mask wearing person. Oh, you, you can't even see their full face, but you can see their eyes. They judging you. You know what's good. <laughs> Dealing with judgment in our hearts is an internal issue, ladies and gentlemen. It's not an external issue. This isn't about looking less judgmental. It's about being less judgmental. It's about actually being merciful. Sometimes we live with the spirit that thinks we're better than everybody else. And it gives us the right to judge anyone who doesn't think like us, who doesn't vote like us, who isn't as educated as we are, who isn't as old as we are, who isn't as cool as we think we are, who isn't as experienced as we think we are. We just can't be that way because it's not good for our souls. And it may be the largest barrier keeping people from coming to know Jesus. The third and final thing that I believe can happen when we wear mercy is we actually, we can see who needs it the most. Matthew 7, verse 3, it says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will clearly you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are professional experts at seeing other people's problems and struggle to see our own in the mirror. We can clearly see what's wrong with our boss. We can clearly see what's wrong with our spouse. We can clearly see what's wrong with our kids. We can clearly see the issues that exist with our in-laws. We can clearly see what's wrong with a Packers fan. We can clearly see what's wrong with a liberal or a conservative. We can clearly see all the people who could use some mercy. Those people over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me give y'all some mercy. But the reality is this. We're the ones who need it most. I'm the one who needs it the most. Whoever that person is in your mind that absolutely drives you crazy. You can't stand the way they talk. You can't stand the way they post. You can't stand the way that they live their life. You have to realize, I have to realize, I am that person in someone else's life. It's when we begin to talk about our own issues, our own hangups, our own planks. Our vision gets blurry. They're called blind spots for a reason. It means we can't see them. The words of Jesus force us to solve this conundrum. How can we think we're seeing other people's issues so clearly if our vision is blurred by our own issues? When it comes to the world around us, we feel like we've got 2020 vision on everything, but that's impossible. We're the ones someone else needs to wear mercy for. Let me tell you how we get rid of blind spots. Truthful friends. We desperately need other people to help us see what we cannot. Some of the things we can't see are things we'd rather ignore. And I know revealing blind spots can be tough and it should be reserved for people we know and trust because these conversations can tend not to go well. Proverbs 27, 6 says this, says wounds from a friend can be trusted. A friend doesn't want to wound you, but sometimes we need the truth and love to be spoken in our lives. And the best way to soften the blow is to invite a friend to be honest with us. Honesty is best received by invitation only. If I ain't asked you to be honest with me, it's probably not going to go well. But if we've built a relationship where we've been given We've, been, we've given each other feedback and permission to be honest. It can be trusted. And I won't get so offended by what you say because I asked you to be honest. So here's what I want everyone to do today. I want you to ask five friends this question. What are my blind spots? What can you see that I cannot? How can I improve? I want you to ask them that. So um, what you can't see right now is uh, there is a group of people 
um, here in Dallas, Texas, uh, where we are filming this message. Uh, re- we've recorded this message for you at City First. And um, we have options, okay, uh, to, to film. And there's an option. I can wear a headset, I can wear a lav mic, or I, I could use a handheld. And so uh, I, I was trying to use this, this headset, okay, from the, the lovely gentleman who is behind the camera right now. I said, hey, do you want to wear a headset? And every time I would use this headset, it would always like kind of fall off. And I'd be just like, man, what's, what's going on, man? I don't really like wearing the headset. And finally, the, like, like with truth and love, I had a couple sound guys just surround me and I showed up to speak and they, they, they let me know something. I didn't know, okay? I, 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 I've been 33, I've been, I've been alive 33 years. Nobody ever told me this. He said, man, I don't know how to tell you this, but you got small ears, man. I said, what? What you talking about? You got no small ears? He said, man, listen, why do you think, why do you think the mic be falling off your head all the time? Like, that ain't, that ain't no coincidence. Like, like, it don't fall off nobody else's head. You... You got small ears. I'm going home like, babe, Amanda, why didn't you tell me I had small ears? I mean, we all need somebody in our life to show us what we can not see. On a more serious note, I had a friend recently tell me, hey man, sometimes people can feel your impatience. You know you have somewhere else to be, but don't go there before you actually have to be there. And I needed to hear that. Here's the deal. If you ask for honesty, don't get mad when people do it. Don't make them pay for what you ask for. How you respond to criticism you ask for the first time will determine if there's ever a second time. At some point, we have to be willing to look in the mirror and judge ourselves. And when we can't see the planks ourselves, we need to phone a friend. This is what happens when we wear mercy is we actually realize that we're the ones that need it. The reality for you and me is we can't wear mercy until we've truly received it. The only reason that you or I can truly wear mercy is because we were given it by a heavenly father to begin with. We can't give what we don't have. And guess what? Our heavenly father gave it to us when we did not deserve it. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for you and for me. And it's only because of his great mercy that you and I can live and breathe. It's one thing when you've never been given mercy. It's one thing when you've never been let off the hook. It's, it's one thing when you've, when you've never gotten a leg up, when you've never gotten, gotten something given to you that you didn't deserve or didn't get something that you did deserve especially when it's punishment, that is, the, by the, that is the definition of mercy. God's mercy is us not getting what we deserve, which is death, hell, and the grave. That's what we deserve. God's going, not on my watch. I got you. I'm going to send mercy. And his name is Jesus. In these next few moments, if you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, I can't think of a better time than to do it right now. If you need mercy to come running to your life right now, if you need new life in Christ, like Paul talked about, like we talked about at the beginning, I want to give you that opportunity right now. If that's you, would you just repeat this prayer after me? Say, Jesus, thank you for dying on a cross for my sins. I ask now that you would be the Lord and Savior of my life. I surrender my future, my life to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, here's the deal. If you made that that decision today, I want you to know it's one of the greatest decisions you have ever made in your entire life. And for the rest of us, man, my hope and prayer is that we would clothe ourselves in mercy, that we would wake up as we are getting ready for the day before we're picking out our outfits, that there would be something in us that says, yeah, I'm gonna wear mercy. And there might be this person at your job you're thinking about going, yeah, I need to wear mercy for them. No, 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 somebody needs to wear mercy for us. And it's essential for 2020 that we clothe ourselves. We gotta put it on. It's a part of the new life that has been given to us by Jesus Christ. God, I thank you so much for this amazing church. God, I pray that we would clothe ourselves in mercy for those around us, for ourselves. Thank you for sending mercy 
when we needed it the most. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody say, Amen.